So I grew up in a car enthusiast household, car enthusiast family. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, my parents were always really supportive of my car passion and my car hobbies, uh, especially my dad. My dad would always tell me about the things that he had read or the experiences he had as a kid doing all sorts of crazy things in cars with his friends. Um, but one thing he always told me about was the Cannonball Run. He had read about it in the magazines when he was in college, and he read the Brock Yates book when it first came out. So as I got older, my dad and I started doing a lot more car things together. We would go out and always have these crazy car adventures, go shopping for something different. Uh, we'd try flipping cars. Uh, we raced for a long time. We started out autocrossing with a 1988 Fiero. We graduated eventually to racing in a ZR1 Corvette, a C4 ZR1. Uh, autocross with that, did some high speed events, did some track days, uh, that sort of thing. But it was always coming back to one day I wanted to do a cannonball run. So a couple times in my life I had tried building a car, tried getting into like that cannonball mindset. And in 2020, I was able to buy a car and really start building it up. The car that I picked was a 2008 Saab 95 Aero. And I'd gone through like this list of what makes a great cannonball car. And I remember when Alex Roy set the record and I remember when Ed Bolian set the record and I remember thinking through like, why did they pick their car? It's gotta be a fast car, obviously. It's gotta fit all the people, fit all the gear. It's gotta be able to handle a long trip, uh, good fuel economy. And especially when I thought about Ed's car and then later Doug and Arnie's car with uh, Ursula, I thought about it's gotta be a little incognito in some events. And so I settled on the 9.5 Arrow because I figured it's a pretty obscure car. Not a lot of people know Sobs. It's difficult to pick out. And especially being a silver car, it's gonna blend in with a lot of things on the road. I ended up getting a 9.5 out of New York, uh, had it shipped home and started building it up. I spent the summer of 2020 building the car. My wife and I took it out actually to South Dakota on a test run in October of 2020. Uh, that proved very helpful. Uh, we learned a few things about the car that needed to be tweaked and tweaked it up over that winter. Eventually in spring of 2021, I was ready to take it out on a run. A good friend of mine from work, Curtis, for some reason volunteered to go with me. And we went out to New York in April of 2021 and we did our first cannonball run. Curtis and I did a, our run in 32 hours and seven minutes, which is fantastic because we ended up tying the DM and Turner time set back in 1983, which was the time to beat when I had first learned about Cannonball. So it was really special to me that we tied that time. And I always knew that there was a little bit more. There was always something more. My Cannonball story had started, but not ended at that point. In planning for that run, I got to know a number of people in the Cannonball community. Uh, one of them was Ben Charlie Safari Wilson. And at the end of our run, Ben sent me a message and said, hey, I know about this 100 horsepower event. It's coming up in November. If you're interested, I can get you an invite. I said, yes, absolutely. I want to get in this event. And that ended up being the musket ball. So I go on the musket ball. And when I'm there, I get to meet a lot of these great cannonball people that you always hear about. People I've talked to, but I've never actually met in person. Um, a couple of them being Mark and Wes. And at the end of the musket ball, Wes and I get together and decide to go have lunch at Cheesecake Factory. We're having conversations of like, hey, who's gonna be the third person? And we're gonna, you know, maybe this person, maybe that person. Well, you know, we come to a conclusion that, hey, let's see if Mark Spence wants to do it. Every time someone reach out, you get that fire to do it again, which, is, which we all have. Whenever a special event comes on, whenever anything cannonball pops up, there's that little fire deep down inside and you just have to keep it going. So when they reached out to me, I was pretty much like, I'm just, I think I'm over it. This is just a, a chapter in my life. But, but if I do it again, I want to take on 7405 because I always knew that there was time left on the table. As soon as you come into New York city, the first place you always go is to the Red Bull. It's kind of just, it's the church of speed is what I like to call it. And we're parked out front and there's these kids walking down the road and they stop and take a picture of the building. And the only reason someone's going to stop and take a picture of the building is because you know it's history and the, and the lineage about it. And we thought for sure that these kids are going to be posting online and tag like Cannonball and, and alert everybody that we were there. Because very few people actually knew we were there. Pull out their phones, they take a picture of the building, and then they look at us 
and we got the sob sitting there with all the antennas and the trunks open and all our bags are there and and we thought for sure we were we were busted right there so we get in the car we get started we figured out the lights like okay this is when this light goes green that's when we're gonna start we head out it takes us approximately five minutes to get out of new york city we get through the tunnel start heading through new jersey there's no issues and we hit pennsylvania you know, we hit Pennsylvania, there's some cloudy weather, some fog, stuff like that. When we were in Pennsylvania, driving along, just making our way through traffic, there happens to be a goose that flies up a tractor trailer's driving and catches the goose, and there's feathers everywhere. So now we can see this bird just in pieces in front of us, and we're like, all right, that's, that was totally unexpected. Right after the first fuel stop, Nick got behind the wheel, and... We, st we came up, up on an Explorer on the turnpike, and it was a canine unit. You'd see the big canine in the back window and everything, and you saw the light bar on the roof and stuff. And, and we, were, we were a little distance behind it because we weren't going to go crazy through it because we were in a construction zone because it's Ohio and everything's under construction. Then we start realizing that it had South Dakota tags on it, that it wasn't an Ohio vehicle. So that's when we proceeded past him. But as soon as we would start to get past him, he'd throw something on his, his laser and or radar and we'd light up and we'd slow back down. He just kept messing with us the entire time until pretty much we were like, you know what? We're just gonna go. We got out of the construction zone and just hammered it and kept on going across 80. As soon as I got back in there, we were, we knew we had Arnie ready to pick us up. He was gonna guide us with his Audi S6, which is kind of a redeeming moment for me because he was scouting for me on my 2830 diesel run when the AMG got destroyed. And I saw that entire thing. And I was very happy that we were able to complete this all through Chicago, all the way into the world's biggest truck stop is where he dove off and turned around. But the worst thing about it is we did this run during a holiday weekend and Chicago traffic was gridlocked bumper to bumper as far as the eye can see. So I know Mark is really upset that we are going through Chicago and it's just gridlocked traffic. But as soon as he gets out of Chicago, he's able to just take off and he is flying, keeping up with Arnie, basically the rest of the way through Illinois. The cool thing is I'm from Wisconsin and that's where my folks live. And like I said, my dad is who got me into Cannonball and my whole family is on the Joiner chat. They're watching the event and all of a sudden I see a message pop up on the Joiner from my dad and he says that he's on the road. Come to find out through a few more messages on the Joiner chat, he is driving down to Illinois to watch us go by, which I'm thinking, okay, that's cool. He's gonna get a video or a picture of us flying by on the highway like you always see. That'll be really nice. And then the next message comes uh, and it says, Chuck is on I-80. Oh, oh no. My dad is on the highway that we are on and like we're really worried he's driving by himself, he's gonna get in the way. So I message over to him and I say, Dad, I see where you are on the joiner map. Get over to the right-hand lane and slow down and watch out because we are coming right up behind you. And sure enough, we see Arnie coming up on my dad and he goes flying by and we come right up behind Arnie and we're flying by my dad. And my dad's over in the right-hand lane and going like 75, 80 miles an hour. And he's looking at his phone, trying to read the message on the joiner chat as we go flying by him. So we missed the whole thing. I felt kind of bad. <laughs> we're heading into Iowa. And it seemed like every time that I was behind the wheel, I would be the one that would get all the achievements on the dash, check engine light, transmission light, all that stuff. Well, this is the part where the transmission light comes on. I'm driving, Nick's in the passenger seat, Nick's the Saab guy. This is actually my first time driving a Saab, so it's an interesting task. So we're doing some research. Nick's like, well, what color is the light on the dash? And he's pretty much troubleshooting it from the passenger seat. We're starting to notice it's like getting a little bit sluggish and our fuel stopped coming up. So I get off the off ramp, hit the stop sign. Now there's a little bit of an incline. Well, at this incline, I come to a full stop. And then when I start getting on the throttle, it's just sluggishly getting through the intersection. I crest over the hill and pretty much roll into the gas station. And now I'm thinking, oh man, all this time we've invested in this. It's all out the window. So I'm just trying to hold it together because we're a three man team and I don't want to sound weak at that moment. Wes is like, hey, I, I think we're done. Uh, this, this looks pretty bad. And I said, as long as you guys are willing to keep going, I'm willing to keep going. As far as I'm concerned, the only way that we're done is when this car leaves on a flatbed. Mark had come up to me and asked the same thing. I told him the same thing. And we just kept trucking along. 
We started the car back up. The light was still on, but it shifted. We went backwards, we went forwards, it was good to go. And we hit the road and made it through the rest of Iowa and Nebraska and most of Colorado until our next fuel stop. So I have to say the most difficult state that we actually traveled through was probably gonna be Utah. At one point we hear one of the devices that we have go off making a tow and saying basically, hey, there's a somebody keying up a radio nearby. Well, we hear that tone go out. I immediately get off the gas. Then we hear the call go out for a vehicle at a very high rate of speed in a very low speed area. And the description is a silver vehicle. Mark hears this. He is looking at me saying, oh my God, that's you. So me being behind the wheel just had that whole conversation play out in front of me. I got the cold sweats and I'm thinking, man, this is a horrible time to be behind the wheel right now. As we crest the hill, we see red and blue lights come on. I'm like, okay, this is for me. Well, I guess they don't know too much about silver passenger vehicles, that there could be more than one at the same time. Well, they pull over a, another silver passenger vehicle and we skate through that. And I was like, wow, that is very close. <laughs> so as we're moving along, probably 10, 15 miles down the road, same interaction happens. High speed comes out, you know, car description, we're at the same mile marker, all that stuff. And who would have thought that a Maserati would have got pulled over instead of a Saab? So that was pretty much the breaking point saying, hey, Utah, they have a bunch of enforcement going on. So we're just gonna take it easy. And then come to find out later on, that was a enforcement month because they just changed the law with super speeding. So they were out being really aggressive. We did our last fuel stop with the leg out that was in Arizona. Uh, and then we hit Vegas. Vegas traffic was really smooth, really easy driving. Um, Mark was driving through that stretch and uh, we get to the California border and the California border, uh, we get through the produce stand, uh, the produce checkpoint really fast and we make our way in for our last driver change which happened to be in Baker, California. Now, every time we would swap out with drivers, we'd always like to take advantage of like, hey, if you need to take a bathroom break, so you don't have to do it in a bottle or you know, a custom made bag to use for those purposes. Uh, we're like, just gonna use the wood line. Well, where we were at, there really wasn't much. There was probably a very small section of woods. So Nick and I went to go run across the street and go into the, the wooded area, the very small area. As we're going up to it, I said to Nick, hey, watch out. You know, there could be homeless people in there because you could see all the debris that was in this little small patch of brush. And Nick starts going, I'm like, all right, I'm like, I don't know, maybe I'm a little more shy. I'm gonna go around the corner. So I head into the bushes and I was just like, oh my God. I'm like, there, there's, there's a dead guy. And when I made that corner, a guy committed suicide and I happened to come right across it. Now I immediately turn around because that's something that you're going to just keep seeing. I turn around, I go to Nick. I'm like, Hey, we need to get away from here. I'm like, this is what I just happened to see. And I made sure, you know, just be professional about it. It's like, just come over here. And Mark or Nick didn't see the person, but reach out to dispatchers and call and say, Hey, this is what we have going on and stuff like that. But apparently it's a common problem to be out there because once the dispatcher told me, she's like, this happens and this is not the only one today. I'm like, oh my God, like that's, that's insane. Finally get that set aside and now we're, we're heading to Redondo Beach. So my first run out in the Saab with my buddy Curtis, we did 32 hours and seven minutes and I knew the car had more in it. I'd done a lot of work to it. Um, and so obviously after the incident with uh, the dead body, that was definitely something that kind of got into our nerves a little bit, but we knew we had to keep on trucking. So. I'm, a, I'm driving for the last leg and we make our charge down into LA. Traffic going into LA was pretty good, you know, all things considering. And as we're coming up to the last couple turns before Portofino, I'm looking down at the clock off on the side and I keep asking how much time, how much time, how much time? And they're like, it's 3150, it's 3155, 3158. There we are sitting at the last light before you turn into Portofino and it's red and there's people everywhere. There's pedestrians, there's cars. There's no way you're running this light. And I just watched it tick over from 3159 to 32 hours. Like, oh no, I can't believe we didn't break 32 hours. The light turns green, we peel off. I drive it around the curb over the speed bumps and we get to the Portofino at 32 hours and one minute. And our turnaround team is waiting there for us. So one thing that we knew was doing it out and back is we wanted to kind of have a fresh start for the eastbound run. 
So when we got to LA, we had two people waiting there for us. We had mailed out a spare, spare tire. They were waiting with gas cans and topped off our tanks. They had extra snacks and supplies and things for us. We all ran inside of the hotel and actually used a real bathroom. About 11 minutes later, we had fueled up, restocked, and we were back on the road heading uh, east again. Wes was getting a little drained out of driving, so I, and on the freeway, the freeway looked wet. The entire time, it just had a certain shine to it that made it look wet, but it was dry. So Wes pulls over and I jump in the driver's seat and I get out and I have one of those days of thunder moments. And so I get out and I go out and I feel the road. I put my hands on the road to see how warm the, and, or cold the road was. And I just get back in the car and I give it all she has. During this time, our buddy Dan Doucette was running overhead for us. And, so it was, and there was a, through Glenwood Springs on 70, there was a fire next to the freeway. And there was a 170 mile reroute around it to get back on track, which was insane in my opinion. And that's why I was going as fast as I could, giving the car all she had so we can make up that 170. And by the time I got through the Red Rocks and all that, I was just, I was drained. My, that driving stint, I don't even know, I think it was about two to 300 miles. I was just drained. And that's when uh, Wes took back over. The weather keeps getting worse and worse and worse. It just, now it's starting to snow. Trying to keep the speed up, but you know, we have good tires, everything like that, but it was just next to impossible. I think I probably got down to 30 miles an hour on the interstate because there was at least two inches on the road and the car was trying to go up a hill and it's skating left and right. And Mark pops up saying, is it, is it snowing? And it, <laughs> there's trucks hitting us with snow driving by. It's, it was just a really bad time through that area. And you hit that point, especially there, that you start getting tired or like you're always like, oh, I can, I can go a little bit more. I can do a little bit better. And whenever you have those moments in Cannonball, that's probably the time you shouldn't try to go anymore where you're like, oh, I, I got a few more hours of driving or I got another hundred miles in me. And that was my mindset because I was like, oh, I got this. Well, I was driving the car and it was really quiet. You know, everything, you know, nothing on the radar. And I look up in the rear view mirror and out of the corner of my eye, I just catch two headlights lining up and it looked like an old like square body truck or a tractor trailer just barreling down on the bumper. And I'd like jump in the driver's seat and Mark's like, are you okay? I'm like, listen, I'm like, we need to change out because this is now unsafe. Because obviously when you're cannonballing, you want to be as safe as humanly possible. And that was at the point I was like, yes, take over. Because we are all sort of like hitting like a point where we're like, okay, we just got to break through this darkness and get back onto it. I take over driving. We do our fuel stop 10 miles later. And when we get to Denver, for whatever reason, like everything just calms down, everything opens up. It's the middle of the night, the roads are clear, there's no weather, and we pick up one of our spotters. And he says, hey, I'm in my M3, try to keep up. I'm gonna just go hammer down until Nebraska. So basically from Denver until just past the Nebraska border, I don't think we were below 140 at all the entire time. Even at one point, Roger said that he actually had passed a trooper at like 120 miles an hour, something crazy like that. And the trooper turned his lights on, but didn't do anything. So Roger's like, well, I guess we're just gonna keep going. So now I got the final leg heading into the city and take over just, you know, Western Pennsylvania. Now, anybody that knows about Pennsylvania, they have some huge potholes. Well, we hit this one massive pothole to the point where I'm like, I just destroyed this wheel. Well, I could tell that it had air pressure because nothing was really going on. And I hear Nick in the back saying, hey, did you just bend a wheel? In my head, I know it was bent, but I was just sort of working my way through it. So that way it wasn't as bad. I can make it, we made it this far. So as we're going through, eventually I look in the rear view mirror and I see Ford Interceptor headlights. And I'm like, I'm just gonna slow down and let this, this trooper go by. Well, needless to say, it was one of our spotters, Dave Collins, just an absolute maniac, blows by us. And we're like, oh my God, that's our spotter. And followed him in through Pennsylvania, New Jersey, lose him when we get into the tunnel in New York, but we actually regained contact with him on 31st just as we're pulling up to the red ball garage. And when we get there, I said to that guy, I'm like, you are an absolute maniac. Our final time in 65 hours, 28 minutes. So we knew that we had beaten the record. We'd beaten it by eight and a half hours, which was way more than we thought we ever could at the time. Just so excited, so happy to be in. And we're celebrating, we're out on the street. When we did that 65, 28, 
I was euphoric about beating my own record. And I don't think anyone else has beat their own record besides Brock Yates. So that was that was a pretty cool thing to be able to deal with, that one of my idols I had something in common with, besides Cannonball. When the flow of congratulations started coming in and everyone was watching us, and it was just a very, it, it, it's a very euphoric moment. And then that's just kind of it. You know, when you finish a Cannonball, it's a lot about what it's done for you and a lot less about what it does for everybody else because there really isn't anybody that cares about it besides our group of people. So it was kind of unique that we actually had a, a welcoming committee there to meet us uh, and celebrate with us. But when it's over, it, it's over. So we just went and got some sandwiches and went back to the hotel uh, and went to sleep. World record holders. So after we completed the run, we're back at the you know the hotel. I have to go get my vehicle because I put in a parking ride because I live nearby. So heading there, I'm just sitting in the back seat thinking, oh, this is probably too good to be true. I, I just feel like this is only going to last for a little bit. And little did I know seven days later that our record be overthrown. Right now, I need you to check out Auto Tempest at the link in the description below to find whatever car you're searching for. They make Car Trek possible and they've been a supporter of Benwicky for the last four years. So please check them out now to find your next car and support them for supporting us.